Welcome to Follow the Medical Record, where healthcare experts give insights into the increasing importance of following a patient's medical record through the health ecosystem with compliance, privacy, security, and efficiency front and center. This podcast is brought to you by MRO and hosted by Don Hardwick, Senior Vice President of Client Relations at MRO. Don has been in the health information management industry for over 40 years and has extensive knowledge of how medical records make their way through the healthcare ecosystem. At MRO, Don is responsible for strategic client engagement programs and overall client satisfaction. To hear from all of MRO's industry experts, be sure to visit MROCorp.com for additional content and to sign up for our monthly e-newsletter. Over to you, Don. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another session of Follow the Medical Record. As we talk today about managing payer denials and healthcare providers, I'm your host, Don Hardwick, and thanks for listening today. As always, you can learn more about MRO and myself on our website at MROCORP.com. And please take a moment to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you. By the way, uh, also follow us on Twitter at MROCORP. I have as my guest today, Don Crump, who is the Senior Director of Revenue Integrity Solutions at MRO. So welcome, Don. Thank you, Don. Good to be uh, here. Before we get started, Don, if you would tell our listeners a little bit about your background and your current role at MRO. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Don. So I have kind of grown up in the um, healthcare space uh, with a combination of experiences across compliance in large healthcare organizations, as well as revenue cycle process improvement. So I've been blessed with the opportunity to see and and work these type of denials and audit requests um, firsthand as a provider, as well as being able to support uh, MRO's clients in their endeavors to reduce their denials overall. So, Dawn, we're, our topic today is denials, but the precursor to the denials are so many audits. What's leading to, first of all, the, the number of audits um, that hospitals and providers are receiving? And then, you know, the secondary piece to that is, is of course, the denial fallout from those audits. So any thoughts here on what's, what's causing the increase uh, of audits to begin with? Yeah, I, what we're really seeing and is is over the course of the last 10 years, you know, payers and their third party auditors have identified the ability to go in and retrospectively review um, the clinical documentation and then try to find the gaps in the documentation that don't support the the claimed or the billed services. And so it's it's always easy to look back on something with hindsight and identify what you could or should have done better. Um, however, that doesn't necessarily make what was billed or what the care that was provided inappropriate. And I think that's the struggle between payers and auditors and the providers who are providing that clinical care to the patients. Um, so you're starting to see more and more of this becoming a business over the last 10 years. Whereas before it was um, kind of a, a an afterthought to go in post payment and just review things for accuracy for fraud, waste, and abuse prevention. Now it's really a business in trying to recoup funds or or uh, reduce payment back to the providers in a lot of ways. And I know it is all wrapped up in a bow with that quality of care. And I'm not saying that there's not um, two sides to the story. But from a provider standpoint, that's what that's what it feels like is happening is looking at everything after the fact and then trying to make judgment calls on what was documented and what was billed. So is it more of a documentation uh, issue or, or or is the industry finding that care wasn't rendered the way it should have been? Which which kind of avenue are these denials associated with? Well, that's a good question, Don, but I think what you would find is that 
more often than not, the care that's being provided is being provided appropriately. There are certainly, um, you know, many instances where there are providers that are getting investigated for fraud, waste, and abuse. But overall, the core clinical environment that we're in, people are providing the care that they feel at the time is deemed necessary. And, And so it might be more along the lines of what is the documentation that is expected by the payer um, versus what is the documentation that is being supplied. We are a very complex health uh, ecosystem, as you well know. And so when you get down to the level of granularity about whether one word means something to a payer versus what it means to a provider can be very different. And then you add in there the complexity around our coding and how those codes translate into bills. And it just leaves a uh, lot of opportunity for both payers and providers to have a he said, she said type of mentality. So, Dawn, you mentioned coding, and that's that's one issue that is documentation related. So Mm -hmm. are the denials that you're seeing and hospitals are experiencing here, are those denials primarily partial a denial of a claim where they're carving out certain pieces of an overall claim. They're not necessarily denying an entire claim as a result of the documentation or coding piece, correct? From a coding perspective, that is correct. What we typically see is we'll see a uh, a downgrade in the coding, um, a removal of a principal or secondary diagnosis that would reduce the expected reimbursement. You might see different um, different codes reviewed that are going to, to change the weight of that specific code. Um, and so that's what, so, so we call it a short pay, you can call it a downgrade, whatever it is, but over, over the course of many of those though, it has a significant impact on on a provider's reimbursement. And it is also harder to track those type of downgrades because you may not get the level of specificity and and outcomes depending on the payer as to what was removed and why, making it harder to appeal. So, so how significant, Don, are these denials and the amount of recoupment or you know partial claims denial uh, from a financial standpoint, the significance of this with the uh, with with the providers. Oh, from a financial standpoint, it's hugely st- significant. Um, you know, an overall percentage is roughly you know ten percent of all claims, and and we're seeing an increase of that depending on the payer mix. So, you're you're really talking about millions and millions of dollars a year, depending on the size of the organization, it can be higher. So, um, you know, when organizations are already in their margins are already squeezed tight, you know, though they have, there's cuts that have to be made somewhere along the lines in order to mitigate the offset of those denials. And so it, it is a significant impact to healthcare organizations. Dawn, I, I didn't realize that that is a huge uh, financial burden on the hospitals. How, how do they, uh, I'm just, I'm almost flabbergasted. So how do they, what tools or how do they monitor and track if 10% in, you know, a financial hit for a facility or as high as 10%, how do they how do they monitor and track all of the denials properly so they can either prove that the denial it was inappropriate to begin with and still maintain you know the integrity of the claim or at least reduce it in some some way by proving that the documentation was there how do they track all of this well it's a good question and and there's various ways that providers are tracking it uh, of course, you know, I, I prefer to utilize a a dedicated system that helps with those audits and denials because it is such a complex mechanism and audits and denials can last for years in the appeal process. So trying to track that in, you know, spreadsheets or within EMR work queues can become very convoluted. Um, So, you know, my recommendation is obviously finding a solution that 
that really allows you to get granular into the root causes of those different denials, as well as where you can then start to become more proactive and provide education or technical um, changes within your EMR to try to capture the appropriate documentation. But in order to do that, you have to be able to identify, you know, what those biggest trends are, where you have your own opportunities for improvement, and where you have the successes on appeals across multiple payers um, and not just in a one-off situation. So you really have to look at it all as holistically as possible. And it's a lot more complex than than a lot of people realize when you're talking about uh, audits and denials that happen either prepayment at the time that a bill is submitted or um, sometimes 60, 90 a year after the payment has already been received and now they're trying to take it back. So really having a solution that helps you identify not only what's going out, but what your successes are, what your failures are, and then why are you failing on those so that you can prevent those mistakes in the future. Don, is there a statute of limitations on how far back a, a payer can go uh, to audit a claim? Uh, it, it it varies. It really does. So, you know, depending on, you know, Medicare, obviously a good rule of thumb for the recovery audit contractors has always been a three-year look-back period, um, at least since, you know, 2009 or so. Um, so there's variations there. Some Medicaid is, is state by state, so it can be up to six or seven years for, depending on the state and the Medicaid organization. And then your commercial players and plans get more complicated because then it becomes associated with what's in your contracts with them. So you could have two organizations sitting side by side in the same state and have completely different contracts and different different look back periods. So it really has accelerated the complexity when you start bringing in and tracking all of this stuff by your commercial plans versus what, you know, what we used to do in the RAC day. And it was just one government auditor that had a statement of work that was consistent. Don, I understand that um, that payers are sort of pushing, if you will, uh, having providers to allow them direct access into their EMR so that they can audit more of the claims uh, electronically where they can get access into the systems. What are your thoughts on the providers allowing the payers with this kind of direct access? It gives me some, some anxiety. Um, you know, especially as a former compliance officer, I, I understand the need to collaborate with payers better as a provider. Um, there's a lot of administrative burden between the two institutions, that's for sure. However, um, I think it, it when there are not controls in place as to how uh, how that medical documentation is being used, how that information is being used, and the transparency around the what was requested when it was requested and what is the outcome of that request that's when it becomes a little bit uh, more concerning because we already see these huge denial rates but we have some trans the ability to have transparency into it and into the outcomes initially these payer platforms and this access to these different um to the different EMR systems on behalf of payers was to help accelerate and help provide better clarity into uh, into the payers' members' quality of care, um, which is very altruistic. But but unfortunately, because there is less transparency into those requests, we don't know if it's being utilized elsewhere. We have anecdotal information of more denials with more. Uh, short pays or downgrades on DRGs. Um, and it's just, it's becoming a little bit more complicated to get that clarity on what the records are being utilized for. So I kind of have a big red, you know, caution or is a, a big yellow caution sign when it comes to this until there's more transparency. Yeah, it seems like to me that, you know, that can be a prescription for disaster at some stage 
uh, that open uh, o- open uh, access. It you know it just seems like that that would be problematic at some stage. Um, maybe not, but it just seems like opening the door to that opens can open Pandora's box in, in some respects from a compliance and privacy uh, standpoint. All, all, albeit that you know they're doing it for the right causes in uh, in their access. It only takes that one bad apple that all of a sudden uh, creates a big problem for both parties. Absolutely. Um, any thoughts on on how hospitals payers can prevent the denials from the beginning? I know that documentation is a big issue and coding is a is a big issue. Any any words of advice for how to prevent them outside of improving your coding and and beefing up your documentation? Any any thoughts on how to how to more broadly uh, prevent the denials to begin with? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think first off, you've got to understand what it is you're getting denied and why. You know, not not all providers and not all cases are winnable or should be appealable. Some of them are just an opportunity for us to learn how to, you know, uh, to to teach coders better, to to teach clinicians better on documentation, to look at what the LCDs and NCDs are. But in order to do that, you have to understand first off. Where are your trends in denials? Because you're not, we don't have the resources to fix everything every day. Um, So you have to prioritize and look and see where do you see those bigger trends on denials and kind of pick off the fruit as you can in order to keep successfully churning and improving and have that continuous quality improvement. So really digging down into the root cause of those trends and identifying if it is something internal with documentation or coding or even within what is being submitted in your EMR templates or looking at what the payer is expecting um, and those those documentation requirements. And then, you know, secondarily, when it comes to and you've identified some of those root cause and what are the things that you're winning on appeal at. So if they're consistently auditing something and you're consistently overturning that on appeal, that just becomes administrative burden. So then working with those managed care teams, working with the payers to say, kind of put up a a, a roadblock and say, you need to stop auditing this because we're winning and 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 it's just becoming administrative bureaucracy at this point. So why are you auditing it? What are the what are those triggers and how do we stop this? And you can even start to put language in around percentages of what can be audited. If there's success rates, then you 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 should not be continuously auditing something where where you're not finding denial. So there's things you can do to work with the payers and with your managed care teams to try to minimize the constant churn. Don, any thoughts or info on the number of appeals that are won, what that what those stats look like? Um, if a hospital is getting a 10% or somewhere maybe south of 10%, max of 10% denial rate, any thoughts or uh, info that you can share on what those appeal results yield for the hospital? Does it end up going down to 3% um, because they do have an aggressive uh, process for addressing the denials? It, you know, it can be, it can get pretty low at that point. So uh, on average, if you kind of trickle it down, you're, you're seeing about a 10% uh, audit or denial rate. If you're if you've got a good process and structure in place, you might get about 30 percent of those are getting denied. You should be appealing at that point. If you've got a confident training program, documentation and coding program, you should be appealing at at minimum 50 percent, but 60 percent of those those audits and requests and and seeing if you can turn over the majority of those. And if you can't, that's where those trends are. That's where you really have to start looking for those opportunities, improvements. And that's why the details matter in these type of situations. And then also pushing back as well to make sure, you know, we still unfortunately see auditors and payers out there who are denying things for 
strictly administrative tasks, late due dates, things like that. The whole concept of of audits and denials is really to make sure that the care that was provided and billed is appropriate for that patient. So denials based off of administrative dates, pages, timelines, things like that are things that should definitely be be appealed on. So Well, Don, thank you so much for joining the show today. Uh, Any parting words uh, at all for our listeners out there? Just make sure you are you're diligent in this. This is uh, the care that's been provided. You know, like I said, the majority of the time has is needed and you should get reimbursed for that care. So if you're not appealing, if you're not monitoring, if you don't have a cohesive process to look across this at all payers, then reach out and give us a call because we are advocates in this pursuit of excellence and this exchange of clinical information to make sure that it's important that you all keep the revenue that you so um, dearly deserve. Well, Don, again, thank you very much for joining the show today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me, Don. For more insights on a patient's medical record through the health ecosystem, visit our show's page at MROCORP.com and be sure to explore additional resources and thought leadership that we have. You can also check out our program page on HealthCareNowRadio.com. And finally, be sure to connect with us on Twitter at MROCORP. Until we talk again, I'm your host, Don Hardwick.